coming up on CMI. The outspoken George Carl transformed himself from NBA bit player into the highest paid coach in professional sports. Now, the lightning rod for controversy sits down with Chris Myers and reveals why the league just ain't what it used to be. The player today has, I think, gotten softer. Did money change that? Was it, was it the amount of money, or is there something else going on here? That... Well, Chris, you know the answer to that. Carl also admits if he'll be satisfied with his career if he never wins a title, explains why Carmelo Anthony's good, but not good enough, and says what his newest superstar did that completely shocked him. Alan Iverson, your view of him before and now that you've had a chance to coach him. Find out if George Carl has the answer to take the Nuggets to the next level. Right now on CMI, the Chris Myers interview. Thanks for joining us. A pleasure uh, to be chatting with uh, George Carl. Nice to nice to see you again. Thanks, Chris. Been a while. Yeah, it has been. But but keeping an eye on things. And as the, as the season winds down, you look toward the postseason. Is a coach ever really satisfied with where his team is at this stage of things? Well, you know, every year has a different personality, and uh, this personality of of change, suspensions, injuries has caused us to be a team a little bit in in transition and a little bit in turmoil. But, you know, our hope is we have enough talent and hopefully enough chemistry to get, get on the right path, on, in the right place. Well, how, how would you describe th this team's personality? Uh, talented, but uh, right now has poor chemistry. Uh, from a standpoint, it doesn't have poor chemistry because poor chemistry makes you bad. We just don't have championship chemistry. I think okay. it's, it doesn't understand mental toughness all the time. It doesn't understand togetherness and commitment all the time. And the chemistry of bringing a team and making it work takes some time. Um, most coaches will say it takes two, three years. And, and, and as the coach, what can you do about chemistry if you don't have two or three years of time? What, what can you do? Is there anything else extra, especially well, with these guys? I think you're in a situation where you, you, you take the circumstances and try to explain them in a positive way. Uh, most of this season, I've stayed away from the negative. But I also don't want to have crutches and excuses out there. Too many times, I think we when we play poorly, we, we bring out well, we don't, haven't had time. We need to throw that out too. We need to get serious. And basketball, the best basketball team in the NBA isn't that far from the 10th basketball team in the NBA. It comes down to little things. And chemistry is so much of the, of the little things that we're talking about. Alan Iverson, your view of him before and now that you've had a chance to coach him. Well, you know, I, you know, I've heard the, the, the tough stories, the negative stories on Allen Iverson. I haven't felt them yet. Uh, I don't think yet. I, 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 but personally, I don't think I will feel okay. it. Okay. Uh, I think he had w ran out of time in Philadelphia, and now he wants to play one more with one more team, and I think that he wants to be in Denver the rest of his career, and he wants to make this a winning team. And as I've told him a couple times, it, this can work. This will work. And and. But it's not going to always be smooth, and it's not going to be rough. And I want him to be a veteran leader. Uh, a veteran leader is a guy that says the right things and leads by example, leads by attitude. And so far, he has done that almost at an A-plus level. I've been shocked. His, uh, the way he talks is very professional. Really? It's very strong. It's very committed. Uh, I don't get the negative trash talking that a lot of, a lot of players have in the NBA. AI wants to be the be a leader on this team, and I think he wants to win. So you can trust him. I trust him right now as much as I trust anybody on our basketball oh, team because okay. I think he wants to win. He plays with passion, and he wants to win. You know, he, does he want to score points? That's what he does well. But I, I don't think there'd be any, qu any question in my mind that AI would would give up scoring to win. If if you if the devil would give him a pack and say, hey, you win an NBA championship if you go ten and five, he'd do it tomorrow. Uh, is it safe to say you've challenged Carmelo Anthony? Well, I think I hopefully I've challenged him ever since I've been here. Uh, but in a way that, that maybe a tougher challenge than ever uh, before. Well, I think younger players don't understand the responsibility to be to, to be a leader of a team. It takes a daily effort. It takes a daily commitment. It takes a daily ability to listen and to be the strong person and responsible for losing as much as responsible for winning. And Melo is a player that can get a lot better at the defensive end of the court. He can get a lot better passing the basketball. He can be a lot more responsible rebounding the basketball. And all these things are things that we just try to bring to his attention. We want him to be a complete player. We want him to be an all-star every year. We want him to be a, a player that wins in the playoffs. 
and pushing him is a part of being a coach to him. Can you can you bench a superstar? Well, uh, the phrase of benching the superstar means I probably was going to take him from 40 minutes a game down to 35 minutes a game, which I don't think is benching. It's just it's it's disciplining or re reemphasizing or reinforcing a, a a concept or a fundamental that you want in the game by taking them out of the game. It's called the hammer in coaching. <laughs> okay. And are, are the, the less of a hammer the now for coaches than in the past? Oh. Does it get worse every year? The guaranteed contract is taking the hammer out of many coaches' hands in the NBA, but I still think the teams that win championships, that contend for championships, the coach is a part of the team. If, you, if the players don't allow the coach to be a part of the team and be responsible for his, his duties and his, his chores, then there will always be a little bit of chaos, a little bit of anarchy in the system. How did the brawl with you know, Carmelo's punch mm -hmm. and suspension affect this team this year and, and you, what you could do or not do with the team? There's an inner spirit to it of negativity, and there's a heaviness to it of, of always having to talk about it, rehashing it, uh, reliving it, seeing it on TV again. Uh, every city you go into, the same questions are asked of you. And I think it, it's been a, whatever you want to say, a heaviness, yeah. a cloud, okay. a burden upon the team, and especially maybe multiple factors on, on Melo himself. Can you find any uh, positive or way to pull something out of that, get beyond it, use it for something? That's what coaches often do. Yeah. Well, you know, I think Melo's whole year has been a year of, of growing up a little bit, maturing. He's had a baby. He's had to, has had the fight situation. He's had a responsibility of a major trade that's going to bring, you know, some expectation to the table. Um, and in general, I think he's handled it very well. Can he be uh, as He can be a top any? five player yeah. in the world. Okay, right up there, no question. He can, if he commits to be a complete player, he can be a top five player in the world. And that's why I think at times as a coach, we don't want to have patience, but the responsibility as a coach is to have patience and to allow him an ability to, to fail and then pick himself back up. And, um, and, uh, you know, and the AI trade was made basically to win playoff basketball. Okay. And uh, we think we have two guys that can win playoff basketball games now, and hopefully we'll get that opportunity. Yeah, so if this team doesn't get into the playoffs, advance in the playoffs, I, mean, I know you'll be disappointed, but but it's a major falling short in your eyes? <laughs> what I don't think it's a major yeah. falling short. Okay. I think it's a period of transition that where there'll be disappointment and there'll be anger. Uh, I think we can win. I think we can win games in the playoffs. Uh, uh, and I think we could be dangerous in the playoffs. We'll continue with uh, George Carl Moore and his uh, coaching career and, and battling cancer when we continue here on CMI. Coming up next, how does being diagnosed with cancer, something that happened to you and your son in the last year, change your view of things? You, you yell at God, uh, you, you, you cuss and you go, why, why him, why, why, the, why? Plus, but basketball, for all that it gave you in your life, I'm, I'm sensing that it also cost you relationships with your wife, your family. NBA basketball is not good for family. It's not good for uh, man-woman relationships. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't even want to see the odds. That's next on the Chris Myers interview with George Carl. Welcome back to the Chris Myers interview with George Carl. And we're talking with George Carl, head coach of the uh, Denver Nuggets. Uh, how does being diagnosed with cancer, something that happened to you and your son in the last year, change your view of things? Um, yeah, for me, it was just, it was a, probably a time in my life where I needed more of a, a sincerity of, of life rather than basketball being everything. And the combination of what happened in my life with family, with my, my kids, with basketball, I think it was just a stage that, uh, in a strange way, it said, hey, slow down and smell the roses. And slow down and don't, don't dominate your life and don't ruin your life because of your passion for basketball. Allow the passion of, of the gym and the passion of the game of basketball 
to be a, a motivative force in you being a good person, being a good father, being a good friend. And I just walk away from basketball a lot easier now, knowing that you know, I hopefully will be a longtime survivor of cancer. Uh, but cancer kills, and it, it's a scary thing. And I've learned a lot about the people, a lot of people who've had a lot worse cancers than I have had. And, and you're over 50. Your, your son, which you wouldn't expect, who's a healthy young man, quite a basketball player, senior at Boise State, had, for you, it was prostate cancer, him, thyroid cancer, diagnosed within, what, a six-month span. That, that had to really shake you up. Yeah, uh, my son and I have had a, a, an interesting life. Uh, you know, we've gone through a divorce, we, we broke apart, we separated, and basketball, my two years out working for ESPN, brought us very close and very close together, and I realized that, uh, you know, that he has a possibility of playing in the NBA, he has a possibility of making money playing basketball. Watching him play is probably as an as enjoyable moment in my life. Uh, seeing him play a game that I love and and then the shock of he having cancer and going through it again it was harder it was harder for me it was easier for me to have cancer than to have your son have cancer it's just you you, you yell at God uh, you 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 cuss and you go why why him why why do why and uh, it's a process it's uh, made us closer it's a process that uh, I think he'll be able to overcome. You know, it's again, it's very similar to prostate. Right. So far, Treat, so good. Treatable, very treatable, very fixable, very you know, long lifespans, and and uh, and I think we have now have a bond that we'll have forever. But but basketball, for all that it gave you in your life, I'm, I'm sensing with a divorce and that time, maybe that you know, I mean, he was a ball boy when he was younger, when you were coaching and traveling and moving around from job to job. That that it also cost you relationships with your wife, your family. Mm -hmm. um, NBA basketball is not good for family. It's not good for uh, man-woman relationships. I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't even want to see the odds uh, of survival of, of a relationship. I had a good marriage and I had a good family for 20-some years. Uh, I'm not going to go into why it broke apart at the end. Uh, I still have a very good family and my ex-wife did a fantastic job with my kids. Uh, my two older kids are are grown up and are moving in a, a fantastic direction. Uh, they're, you know, you move from parent to friend, it's a, a good time. Yeah, and you have uh, remarried and have a two-year-old daughter, so that's going well. <laughs> different priorities now, right? Yeah. Or different adjustments. Yeah, I'm, you You're know, better this time around, you think? Uh, you'll oh, be better? yeah, I de definitely am going to be a better parent, better, a better father, and uh, you, you, you worship and you admire the moments. And, and one thing about at being older is I think you understand humility, you understand the lower, lowering of your ego. I don't think any player, anybody that coaches the NBA is ego free or ego -less. But again, understanding that you're just a piece of the basketball world and not the basketball world is, uh, and, and, and the achievement for me is to develop excellence, a program of excellence, which you know, my lifetime has been kind of into, we have never won a championship, but I'm very proud of teams that win a lot of games and win and win and play a good brand of basketball year in and year out. And uh, in Denver, I think I got an organization, I got an owner in Stan Kroenke that wants to win a championship. We'll continue with uh, George Carl, the controversial side of George. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't had a chance to get to that. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs> Coming up next. I remember one NFL coach told me, too, it was good because he, he didn't want to get fined. He said, I can't comment on bad officiating. Sometimes I think the arrogance of our referees drives, drives players and coaches to a confrontation. And referees are never going to make a player or coach happy. Plus, best player you ever coached uh, so far. Get the answer next on the Chris Myers interview with George Carl. Coming up next on the Chris Myers interview, George Carl blasts modern players for lacking old school toughness. I like guys that just care about basketball. 
But you know, guess what? That, that, it's that, not going to happen anymore. That society there, is there's going to be rap music. There's going to be acting. Also on the way. How much longer do you, do you think you want to coach if your health is good? Stick around for the answer when we return with more of CMI, the Chris Myers interview. Welcome back to the Chris Myers interview with George Carl. Now we're talking with uh, George Carl, a uh, still got a little North Carolina blue, and yeah, that'll always be, that'll always, always. Go everywhere. Uh, you took your name out of consideration some time ago. I guess it was what around two thousand year two thousand. Well, year Coach job. Guthridge was, resigned. Uh, there was a big. I was in Milwaukee at the time and could not get out of my contract. And uh, you know, but would you, I, is that a dream? Is that your a dream job beyond the pro game? Oh, I've never coached college basketball. I have a lot of friends that say I enjoy it more if I coach college. It's be a little slower. Uh, I think I'll coach college someday. I don't know. I will be North Carolina now because I think Roy Williams is going to have that job forever, and he does a fantastic job. And you know, for years with Coach Smith and Coach Guthridge, everybody was wondering who would get the job. And and then when it came open, Roy turned it down. Larry couldn't do it. George Carl couldn't do it, and went to Matt Doherty. And I think in deep down inside, we were disappointed that one of, you know, Larry or I or, or Roy didn't take the job. And for, for years, we were, were you know, we, we were kind of hung up and a little, little, little sad by it all. And fortunately, Roy went back, and now we're all happy. The Carolina family's back. We're now back being the supporting family that we love to be. Uh, can you be, and, and you are one who thought of as a player's coach, can you be too much of a player's coach at the pro level and get burned? Uh, you know, I think it flip-flops because, you know, early in my career, people thought I was too tough, yeah, too yeah, rough, disciplinary, yeah. too, too, too angry, too, yeah. too confrontational. Uh, I think the game changes, and you've got to change with the game. And your team has different personalities. My team in Seattle was, was, a, was a, an emotional bunch of guys that liked intensity. And I don't know if there's that many teams left in the NBA that – kind of where that where, where we were just competitive SOBs that wanted to go out and get after you and the player today has I think gotten softer I think the player today has gotten to be more of a a Michelangelo type of person it's you know I like guys that just care about basketball okay. but you know guess is what that, is that, is it's that, not going to happen anymore is that society they're, they're going to be rap music there's going to be acting there's going to be there's going to be businesses there's going to be commercials there's going to be ESPN did money change that is it, is it the amount of money or is there something else going on here that Chris you know the answer to that yeah, of course I money mean has money the money has gone yeah. incredibly and the, the game has become a money power influence situation but the game of basketball hasn't changed. It's still about competing. It's still about team. It's still about togetherness. It's still about defense. It's still about being unselfish. The game hasn't changed. I don't think, I, I mean, the game 30 years ago is very similar. It might be, the players might be bigger, might be quicker, might be more athletic. But the fundamental nature of the game and why you win, you know, you can see it in a junior high basketball team or you can see it in the NBA championship basketball team. You said many controversial things real quick. Some of the referees you've been fined and, and reprimanded. For, I remember one NFL coach told me, too, it was good because he, where he didn't want to get fined. He said, I can't comment on bad officiating. So that was his way of kind of working around it. Have you learned to uh, tone it down a little? Yeah. Last four or five years, I've stayed away from refereeing. Okay. <laughs> I got suspended last year because I, was, I, I felt I had to stand up for my team. And I did it in a, in a poor way that the league office thought I deserved to be suspended. I never understood that one. I know the NBA officials are the best officials in the world, but it's like you asked me about Melo. That doesn't mean they can't be better. That doesn't mean they shouldn't be reprimanded. That doesn't mean they shouldn't be pushed to, to improve. Uh, sometimes I think the arrogance of our referees drives, drives players and coaches to a confrontation. And I, I just I think they've they've addressed it a little bit. They're trying to be more communicative on the sideline, uh, but it's a confrontational situation. I mean, referees are never going to make a player or coach happy. We're always going to be somewhat disappointed in the call, 
and especially in close games, it, it's a confrontational position. Uh, best player you ever coached uh, so far? You've had all, going back through the years, Sean Kemp, Gary Payton. I mean, you've got some guys now in Denver that. Yeah, I give the tilt. I probably give the tilt to Gary Payton. Okay. You know, it's close between he the and glove. Sean. <laughs> Defense uh, there, right? But I think it's just his competitive nature, and I think he was better longer than Sean. And but Ray Allen was a great player in the, in in Milwaukee. He was probably the one player I wish I would have coached differently okay. because I think you know we drifted away from each other at the end. Most people I coach I feel have had their best years under me, but Ray I think has probably had some great years without me. Uh, and the best player probably of all of them can be Carmelo Anthony. Uh, before we before we leave it, you you it was a wrote a paper or looked into uh, excellence in, in coaching at the championship level or, or the success right, right? simplify it championship versus 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 winning okay what's more important winning. okay uh, as a coach if you if I if I said to you thirty years of coaching if you won twenty nine years if you won had twenty nine record twenty nine winning records and one losing record and no championships would you take that or would you take fifteen and fifteen 15 winning seasons, 15 losing seasons, but win a championship. Ooh, What's the better career? I think the better career is 29 years of excellence. I really do. I mean, and, and I look at a lot of great coaches who have not won championships as better coaches than coaches that, who, that have won championships. But in our society, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the championship. And I might be rationalizing now because I've never won the championship. I've been in a lot of finals, but have not won the championship. And there is a drive in me to win that championship, but I also have a drive in me to do what I do well, and that's develop winning programs and hopefully develop a program of excellence. Now how much how much longer do you, do you think you want to coach if your health is good? Uh, I think you're going to see me coach till I'm 70. Good. I'm you 50, love, you, you love I'm 56. I don't know if yeah. I'm going to be coaching the NBA. Right. I mean, but I, I don't think I'll ever get out of the gym. Uh, you you know, I'm not sure I'll be a head coach either. You know, I, I, I might be moving in that stage where being an assistant coach, I think my son wants to coach someday. Oh, and, totally. uh, okay. So that might be a situation that I'll sit on his bench like uh, as an assistant coach someday. But you love basketball. It's with you. It's in you. It's, it'll never leave you. It, the passion of the game is still beautiful. Uh, the soul of the game is being tarnished by guaranteed contracts and the big money. But the, the passion and soul of the game is real, and that's why people like it. Good. Well, I'm glad you're, you're still in it and hope you're in it for a long time. Thanks for your time. It's always great talking to you. Thanks, Chris. Right. Appreciate right. you coming Appreciate to Denver. It. All right. It's great to be here. George Carl, head coach of the Nuggets. We thank him. We thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time here at CMI. Take care. Tune in next week when Chris sits down with Lou Pinella, who reveals his plan to bring a World Series title to Wrigley Field. The fiery manager also explains why he's traded in his short fuse for a long run with the Cubs. That's on the next episode of CMI, the Chris Myers interview. Welcome back to the Chris Myers interview with George Carl. And we're talking with uh, George Carl, a uh, uh, still got a little North Carolina blue, and yeah, that'll always be, that'll always, always. Be everywhere. Uh, you took your name out of consideration some time ago. I guess it was what around two thousand year two thousand. Well, year Luke Coach Sound. Guthridge res resigned. Uh, there was a big. I was in Milwaukee at the time and could not get out of my contract. And uh, you know, but would I, you, is that a dream? Is that your a dream job beyond the pro game? Oh, I've never coached college basketball. I have a lot of friends that say I enjoy it more if I coach college. It's be a little slower. Uh, I think I'll coach college someday. I don't know if it'll be North Carolina now because I think Roy Williams is going to have that job forever, and he does a fantastic job. And you know, for years with Coach Smith and Coach Guthridge, everybody was wondering who would get the job. And and then when it came open, Roy turned it down. Larry couldn't do it. George Carl couldn't do it, and went to Matt Doherty. And I think in deep down inside, we were disappointed that one of, you know, Larry or I or, or Roy didn't take the job. And for, for years, we were, were you know, we, we were kind of hung up and a little, little, little sad by it all. 
And fortunately, Roy went back, and now we're all happy. The Carolina family's back. We're now back being the supporting family that we love to be. Uh, can you be, and, and you are one who thought of as a player's coach, can you be too much of a player's coach at the pro level and get burned? Uh, you know, I think it flip-flops because, you know, Early in my career, people thought I was too tough, yeah, too yeah, rough, disciplinary, yeah. too, too, too angry, too, yeah. too confrontational. Uh, I think the game changes, and you've got to change with the game. And your team has different personalities. My team in Seattle was, was, a, was a, an emotional bunch of guys that liked intensity. And I don't know if there's that many teams left in the NBA that kind of were that, where we were just competitive SOBs that wanted to go out and get after you. And the player today has, I think, gotten softer. I think the player today has gotten to be more of a, a Michelangelo type of person. It's, you know, I like guys that just care about basketball. Okay. But, you know, guess what? Is that, is that, it's that, not going to happen anymore. Is that society? There, there's going to be rap music. There's going to be acting. There's going to be there's going to be businesses. There's going to be commercials. There's going to be ESPN. Did money change that? Is it, is it the amount of money, or is there something else going on here? That Chris, you know the answer to that. Yeah, of course, I mean, money. money the it. money yes, has gone right. incredibly. And the, the game has become a money, power, influence situation. But the game of basketball hasn't changed. It's still about competing. It's still about team. It's still about togetherness. It's still about defense. It's still about being unselfish. The game hasn't changed. I don't think, I, I mean, the game 30 years ago is very similar. It might be, the players might be bigger, it might be quicker, it might be more athletic. But the fundamental nature of the game and why you win, you know, you can see it in a junior high basketball team or you can see it in the NBA championship basketball team. You said uh, many controversial things real quick. Uh, some of the referees, you've been fined and, and <laughs> reprimanded. For, I remember one NFL coach told me, too, it was good because he, where he didn't want to get fined. He said, I can't comment on bad officiating. So that was his way of kind of working around it. Uh, have you learned to uh, tone it down a little? Yeah, last four or five years, I've stayed away from refereeing. Okay. <laughs> I got suspended last year because I, was, I, I felt I had to stand up for my team. And I did it in a, in a poor way that the league office thought I deserved to be suspended. I never understood that one. I know the NBA officials are the best officials in the world, but it's like you asked me about Melo. That doesn't mean they can't be better. That doesn't mean they shouldn't be reprimanded. That doesn't mean they shouldn't be pushed to, to improve. Uh, sometimes I think the arrogance of our referees drives, drives players and coaches to a confrontation. And I, I just I think they've they've addressed it a little bit. They're trying to be more communicative on the sideline, uh, but it's a confrontational situation. I mean, referees are never going to make a player or coach happy. We're always going to be somewhat disappointed in the call, and especially in close games, it, it's a confrontational position. Uh, best player you ever coached uh, so far? You've had all, from going back through the years, Sean Kemp, Gary Payton. I mean, you've got some guys now in Denver that. Yeah, I give the tilt. I probably give the tilt to Gary Payton. Okay. You know, it's close between he and, and Sean. <laughs> Defense uh, there, right? But I think it's just his competitive nature, and I think he was better longer than Sean. And but Ray Allen was a great player in the, in in Milwaukee. He was probably the one player I wish I would have coached differently okay. because I think you know we drifted away from each other at the end. Most people I coach I feel have had their best years under me, but Ray I think has probably had some great years without me. Uh, and the best player probably of all of them can be Carmelo Anthony. Uh, before we before we leave it, you you it was a wrote a paper or looked into. Uh, excellence in, in coaching at the championship level or, or the success, right? right? Simplify it. Championship versus, versus, versus winning. Okay. What's more important? Winning. Okay. Uh, as a coach, if, you, if, I, if I said to you, 30 years of coaching, if you won 29 years, if you won, had 29, record, 29 winning records and one losing record and no championships, would you take that or would you take 15 and 15? 15 winning seasons, 15 losing seasons, but win a championship. Ooh, What's the better career? I think the better career is 29 years of excellence. I really do. I mean, and, and I look at a lot of great coaches who have not won championships as better coaches than coaches that, who do, that have won championships. But in our society, it's, it's, the, it's, it's the championship. And I might be rationalizing now because I've never won the championship. I've been in a lot of finals, but have not won the championship. And there is a drive in me to win that championship, but I also have a drive in me to do what I do well, and that's develop winning programs and hopefully develop a program of excellence. Now how much? How much longer do you, do you think you want to coach if your health is good? Uh, 
I think you're going to see me coach till I'm 70. Good. I'm so you, 50, love, you, you love. I'm 56. I don't know if yeah. I'm going to be coaching the NBA. Right. I mean, but I I don't think I'll ever get out of the gym. Uh, you, you know, I'm not sure I'll be a head coach either. You know, I, I I might be moving in that stage where being an assistant coach. I think my son wants to coach someday. Oh, and, totally. Uh, okay. So that might be a situation that I'll sit on his bench like uh, as an assistant coach someday. But you love basketball. It's with you. It's in you. It's, it'll never leave you. It, the passion of the game is still beautiful. Uh, the soul of the game is being tarnished by guaranteed contracts and the big money. But the, the passion and soul of the game is real, and that's why people like it. Good. Well, I'm glad you're, you're still in it and hope you're in it for a long time. Thanks for your time. It's always great talking to you. Thanks, right. Chris. Appreciate right. you coming appreciate to Denver. It. All right. It's great to be here. George Carl, head coach of the Nuggets. We thank him. We thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time here at CMI. Take care. To see bonus footage of this interview, log on to FoxSports.com on MSN. That's where you'll find streaming video from past interviews and previews of upcoming guests. It's only at FoxSports.com on MSN. Keyword CMI.